I've always had a sort of a love-hate relationship with the cassette tape deck. I mean, on one hand, it's really cool because back in the day, you could take your records, you could record them to one of these little compact cassettes, and you could play them in your car. Or you could put them in your portable cassette, re cassette player and listen to them. You know, your boombox or your Walkman later on. So they were really convenient. And if you knew what you were doing and you bought really good equipment and good quality cassettes, you could actually coax them into sounding pretty good as well. But on the other hand, you had a mechanical nightmare inside there with all these little belts and gears and things. And of course, there's the whole science behind how the cassette works and how the electronics works. And to me, I just dreaded having to work on these things. So I managed, for the most part, to avoid doing much work at all on cassettes back when they were really popular. And so therefore, I never got really good at servicing them. But lo and behold, I have the desire once again to have a good functioning cassette deck. And I want one of these Pioneer series to go with my other Pioneer gear. So here we have before us a Pioneer CTF-1250, which was kind of sort of their top of the line cassette deck back at this era. I don't know, I heard that this one is supposed to work, but I don't know, it's not in the greatest condition of all. Uh, the screws are missing, the <laughs> thing's coming apart, but I think it's good. Now, from what I understand about these, I've been warned by a few people who know more about this than myself, that one of the biggest problems with these, if you're going to restore one, is the tape head itself. These are a specially designed tape head. They're not, and you could see how it's shaped compared to a normal cassette tape head. And one of the problems, to my understanding, is that these have a very delicate, I don't know if it's like a ferrite core or something, but they internally they will actually crack. And when that happens, the tape head is ruined and you can't really fix them. Uh, I guess there are some places that used to exist, I don't know if they do anymore, that you can send them out if there's just a surface problem and have them resurfaced. But if it's cracked internally, the only alternative is to replace the head. And, uh, and apparently these heads are not common. They're specific to this deck and they're very hard to find. So I think our first thing is we're going to have to make sure this thing even is worth fixing before we fix it. So if you're willing to come along with me for the ride, uh, I guess we're going to find out if I can fix a, and uh, restore a Pioneer CTF-1250. Ugh. Well, you know, sometimes you have to overcome your fears, and the best way to do it is to face it head on. So that's what I'm going to do. Now, for those of you who like to recap things, let's just behold. Wow. Is that enough capacitors for you? Everywhere you turn, there are capacitors in this thing. And it kind of reminds me of the big jar of gumballs, you know, chewing gum. And the idea was to guess how many gumballs were in the big glass jar. And whoever got closest to that number would win. You could almost play that game with capacitors on this thing. I mean, look at this small board itself. They're just everywhere. And again, I don't know, maybe these caps are all good. Who knows? And beyond that, 
look at all the adjustments. Now, of course, hopefully nothing has ever been touched, so these should all still mostly be in alignment. But look, all these white little potentiometers and these little coils here. Everywhere you look. So you can see this is going to be a bit of a challenge. Now we'll get a little bit more into, you know, how, you know, bias and so forth works. But I can already see, just looking here at the top, here's a motor and there is no belt on that motor. Luckily, I did order a set of belts for this. So I do have belts and they're good quality ones. They're not the cheapos. So uh, I should should be able to be okay with that. And I was able to find an idler tire uh, the, the same place. So I guess before we do anything else, we just want to kind of take inventory and see if this thing even works. Okay, looking at the fuse, I noticed right off the bat that this was set to the 120 volt uh, range when I got it. But when I look at the fuse, the fuse is a one amp fuse. I don't know if you can see that on the camera or not. And it says right here, for 120 volt use, you want a 250 volt 1.5 amp fuse. For 220 and 240, you want a one amp fuse. So this could mean one of two things. Number one, this, this tape deck came from overseas, like from Europe or someplace like that, that uses 240 volt mains. And it came with a one amp fuse and somebody switched it to 120 volts when it came over here into the States. Or second scenario could be that the fuse in fact has blown and somebody replaced it with the wrong value of fuse. I'm not sure. Uh, but we definitely have the wrong fuse, but I'm not going to worry about that right now. I'm just going to put this back as is. The fuse is smaller than it should be, but I'm sure for right now we'll be okay. Let's plug this thing in, and certainly I'm going to put it on some current limit and see what happens. Okay, we're hooked up to some current limiting. Let's turn this on and see what happens. Okay, well, there's a little delay there, but it turned on. Hmm. And I see a capstan turning. Of course, there's no cassette. Let's see if we can find a tape. Of course, I don't think I don't think it's going to work because we're missing a belt up here, and I'm not sure what this belt is. I probably should do a little more research on the mechanics on this. I do know, what little bit I do know is that some of these uh, that had two or three motors in them, this one, two motor, this is a two motor, some of them are three motor, they will use one motor for the capstan and then they'll use another motor for the take up uh, wheels. And uh, if this is running the take up wheel, then obviously when this thing starts running, the cassette's not going to move so uh, and it'll eat the tape so I really can't put a t cassette in there without without it eating the cassette is what I'm thinking so we're not going to do that I do have the full manual for this and it's I don't know it's real thick it's like a hundred pages so this is going to be a really involved project and I don't know how many parts it's going to be and I don't even know if I'm going to be successful but before we do anything else Let's get the front off and kind of let's do a little bit of research about this transport assembly and see if we can get a belt in there and clean it up so that we can at least try it. Well, I flipped this thing on its side and to my horror, look at that. Something got on there. I don't know what, but I mean, this is 
severely rusted. So something leaked in there. We'll just have to get this apart and see what that is. I don't know if this was put on, you know, set on something or if something leaked down in there. Uh, but whatever it is, it looks really bad. Hopefully the rest of it isn't that bad. Okay, really good news. It looks like this is on the outside of the chassis. So here's the cover plate. And if you flip it around, you can see nothing got in from this side, just other than what leaked around the edge. So whatever it is, it was spilled on the outside, and this can be cleaned off and, uh, and repaired. So good news there. Okay, first thing, let's get this off. <clears throat> this is just a little cover that covers the head assembly. And that sure doesn't look stock to me. I don't know. I mean, you look at the erase head. Move the camera a little bit. That kind of looks like some janky soldering, if you ask me. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to remove this tape head assembly from here. I am going to make a few little reference marks just in case and then uh, take this out. So give me a second. Okay, let me get this screw out. And I just scribed a little line around the frame of this, although I think it does reference pretty well. Uh, but you never know. And let me see if I can get this another screwdriver here the correct one okay take this one off you know what guys I'm gonna move the camera for a minute while I finish this so that that doesn't happen again <laughs> the screw doesn't fall Okay, so the hex screw up here comes out, and then these two Phillips screws, and then the head assembly should be free from the tape transport, and it is, you can see. So let me move that. You can't really get to uh, the switch assembly here until you get the transport out. Okay, let me put my microphone on here. So, one, two, three, four screws there. One screw right here above this potentiometer, and then one, two screws down here, and the transport is loose. Now I'm going to have to turn it around and disconnect a few wire bundles, and then we can get this whole transport out onto the bench where we can service it. Okay, the transport is out and on the bench to service. And I just took a poly bag and put it around the tape head assembly so that it doesn't get scratched or damaged in any way. And we'll just set this off to the side so we can focus on getting this thing straightened out. Sorry about the shadow here, but that's as good as we're gonna get because I'm not gonna go crazy on my lighting. Looking at the diagram in the service manual, there's two different pages of diagrams for disassembling the tape transport assembly. And what I'm going to start out with is getting the rear part off. I'm not going to worry about this front stuff right now, but this frame assembly has to come off the back so we can get into service all of this and uh, get to the belts, all that sort of thing. So. That's what we're going to start out with. Let's get these five screws out of here. And I'm actually doing this for my benefit as much as yours because there are many different types of screws in this. And by uh, filming this, I actually can get an idea of uh, which screw goes back where. You can see these are the ones that are the coarse thread, kind of a sheet metal type screw. 
and they screw directly into the plastic so we're gonna have to be really careful because plastic kind of gets brittle on here and there we go so let me undo these wires once again and get this out okay take this potentiometer out here it's just one screw and it's this type of screw. Get that off. And then we have a few other wires, and I'm not sure if I want to going to be able to work around them or not. And then we have to pay particular attention to this little piece of spring wire in here. It goes down in here. And there we go. Let me see if I can loosen these a little bit more. This has absolutely been serviced by somebody before. You can see right here, if you notice how this has a little catch across the top. See that? But on this side, I don't know if I can get it in the camera, you can see it's broken off. The little cross piece on these little this little tab. And it looks like you could see glue where somebody had tried to glue it at some point in time. So I'm not sure what I'm going to do about this, but we're going to have to do something to fix that. Because this is what holds the cassette in. You see that? In addition, while taking this board off, the cable clamp was straightened out like this and all the wires were out of it. So I know somebody's been working on this and tried to repair it unsuccessfully or something. I don't know. I removed this solenoid wire from the board and it goes on to VCC right here and I marked it with a little piece of heat shrink and I wrote on it. This is a good trick. You can actually take this polyolefin heat shrink and mark on it with a permanent marker and then when you shrink it, it shrinks down and it, it actually makes a really good marker wire or wire marker. Okay, to get this secondary cap stand out of here, you can see this little nylon clip. We take that off, and this comes right out like that. And we're going to store this over here out of the way. As you can see, you need a lot of little containers to keep all your parts separate so they don't get lost. Because little things like that can cause you a lot of grief trying to replace them. Okay. Okay, we're now going to re remove these three screws here, here, and here. You can see they're little tiny things. And as long as we have enough slack on this wires, we should be able to get this out. And there it is. And that's your motor coil. And then we should be able to get, look how cruddy that is. Should be able to get the cap stand motor out. Now the rotor and the stator is back here. And if you look, these wires are hair thin. I don't know if you can see them or not, but you don't want to break those. You can see right there. Very, very tiny. So we're going to be exceptionally careful with all of this. Okay, if you notice on the inside of this rotor, there's little serrations in there, and Bella is going to complain because I think she wants a treat. And if you look up here where this came out of, you can see a stator plate and it has also has little serrations cut in it and it's coupled to a coil I don't know if you can see that coil of wire back there what this does is there's a mat this is magnetized this is a magnet 
and as it rotates these teeth create a little pulse train which acts as feedback for the uh, speed so it's a tack feedback circuit so we want to take this out and uh, be able to service it and you can see the two wires right there and they're going to be tighter than banjo strings if you <laughs> move it too far so we want to take this out so we can remove this assembly as well all right with the cap stand motor taken out of the way we can now get these six screws out there's one two three four five six i think and then this will come off like this and what's left of our belt falls out and there we go so we have the counter belt and we have the take up belt and we have the idler and all of those are going to need to be replaced all right i have removed this little piece here and this is the holder clip for the cassette and you can see where this is broken off and i've taken i actually went down to the shop and i picked up my little sander and this is what i use for dressing frets on the uh, guitar necks yeah i've built a few guitar necks in the past from scratch and i have these tools here these little sanders i don't even remember where i got them from but uh there you go oh boy made in usa i don't know if it says no there's no name or anything on it but anyway i cleaned these off sanded them down a little bit and got all the crud off and what we're going to do is we're going to make a little brace that goes on there so here's what we've come up with and i started with a, just a strip of copper and let's see where did it go and i used this as like a little anvil because this is exactly the same diameter as the little plastic and what this is looks like Stonehenge doesn't it <laughs> so this is my Stonehenge <laughs> thing anyway I've reinforced the top so it doesn't break off and what's going to happen here you know, at least if it works I don't know this is this is all an experiment is this will slide over top of here and it will hold that piece in there like that and hopefully that will and I have enough glue surface down inside these channels that I should be able to get enough glue to hold it and then I'm going to fill in the opening at the bottom so these tabs are reinforced a little bit so they don't break off again and I may even do that on this side uh, just for added strength Okay, as we mentioned earlier, this thing has dual pinch rollers, and they're two different diameters. One of them's an 11 millimeter, the other one's a 10 millimeter, I believe. And these both come up, and that belt connects them together, so they both turn in unison. And when these come up, you have to push this down, it hits the two pinch, the two cap stands, and that's what controls the tape across the heads. I'm probably going to pull these and send them out and have them rebuilt. I checked them and they're, they're really hardened. Um, they don't seem to have grooves worn in them, but you can see uh, a mark where the tape was. So I'm probably going to send them out and have them rebuilt. Since these have really nice brass bushings, we should be able to do that. So we have this done down here. And while that's curing, I'm going to move over here and start working on the this part of the transport here. I've already begun by pulling the hubcaps off and these two little nylon washers. And that releases these so that we can get them off to take them apart and clean them. And I'm going to do these one at a time. So I'll pull this first one off and then I'll take it apart and clean it and then put it all back together. 
and then I will take the other one and clean it and put it back together. And we'll replace these belts while we're at it, as well as this rubber idler. Okay, well these guys are in the ultrasonic cleaner taking a bath. I'm cleaning off all of these and getting all the gunk and we're going to service the motor here in a minute. And yes, the motor is good. I know these are notorious for failing, but this one's still good. I've removed the old tire and it still is rather pliable. It's not perfect, but it has swollen and stretched a little bit. And uh, here is the brand new one. So we're going to put that on and reassemble this and lubricate it and get it all put back together. Okay, I have the transport back in and I'm going to put the faceplate back on. I just kind of have the wires all over the place right now. Nothing's real neat and I don't care about that. I really don't care about wow and flutter or anything like that. I'm just looking to see if this tape head's going to be playing okay and if it works. If it does, then we're going to continue on. And if it doesn't, then we're going to have to stop and wait to find a tape head. All right, this is the only tape I could find. And I'm sure, well, I'm not sure if it'll get a copyright strike. It was one of those, you know, dollar tapes you got. But believe it or not, it's on a chrome tape. So I did set it to chrome. And we're just going to play a short clip to see if it works. I don't know. Well, that sounds good. The, uh, the solenoid kicked. Let's hit play. All right. Well, it sounds like I have... I have a channel out. Not sure what that is, but let me fiddle with that. Well, it's not out, but it's kind of scratchy, and I think I have some of these controls are kind of cruddy. Okay, it turned out to be this switch is real cruddy. <laughs> I've switched it back and forth a few times. It's working fine now. I'll play real quick. So it is playing. And, uh, well, we don't know how good the head is, but we know that the head is playing both channels, which is good. I don't, I don't know if you could see right here the little wisp of smoke coming up. It's ever so small. See it? It's hard to see. But it's coming, I think, off of this resistor, which is pretty darn hot right now. And it's all this dust and dirt on it is burning. I don't think the resistor is hotter than it's supposed to be. I just think there's so much crud on it that it's burning. So this thing's, you know, full. You could see how much dust and dirt and crud is in this thing. So, well, we've got our work cut out. All right, I'm going to stop this part right here, and uh, we'll do a couple more tests in the next video, and we'll see where we are. So until then, I wish you all peace, joy, happiness, and good health in your lives, and we'll see you again real soon.